Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to start with Joy to the World on page 270. Yeah. So we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Joy to the World 270.
to uh, function at their highest ability. Uh, we just pray that uh, you continue to watch over all of us, <coughs> keep us safe. Uh, Lord, we just pray for the ones that are traveling, that uh, you give them safe journeys. <coughs> Lord, we just ask now that uh, you'll be with us through the rest of the service, that you'll be with Mark, that he will uh, speak the truth and, and uh, from your word, uh, that we will gain uh, more knowledge and be able to uh, present your gospel to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The message is 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. 245. <laughs> to your life, you need to remind it this way, that God has had a plan 
Uh, he always has had a plan, uh, maybe particularly to drive the point home that I really want you to get from uh, the message this morning is simply this. God's eternal, God's plan is eternal. So just hold on tight, okay? Uh, we move into a time of Christmas, uh, and with that comes lots of decoration uh, and uh, decorations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know that sometimes it seems uh, that uh, every year I get up and talk about decorations and how the house gets decorated. Uh, but uh, sometimes there's, uh, the simple things in life are what we can learn uh, the most for, from. Uh, Emma was excited, wanted to get all the Christmas decorations out early, uh, and so she was buzzing around, pushing and pushing and pushing uh, everybody to get things done. Uh, we have to do this, have to do that. But it was before Thanksgiving, and you don't do that. You drag your feet, right? Uh, you got to slow everything down uh, and keep it in its right time. But she pushed hard enough uh, that it got Mom into uh, getting things ready. And so uh, at our house, I'm not sure how your houses work, uh, we started getting down, and we knew that we can't decorate on our own. Okay, we, we know that it doesn't work that way. Uh, where I would put things in the way that I would decorate just wouldn't cut it. <laughs> we just wouldn't put it uh, straight that way. Uh, and so uh, Penny gets uh, out and starts putting things together and put this here. Elijah and I are the grunt work. Uh, you know, the good news is I'm turning that over to him. More and more, don't tell him, okay? <laughs> the way that that has to haul things down and put things up and climb up uh, into the attic and, and such. But the point of, of that simple decoration is there was a point where I was standing around going, okay, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's next. I don't know where things go. I've only lived in this house for 20-some years. I have no clue what decorations go where and how they are supposed to be put out. But in the end, everything was decorated perfectly. The house looked amazing, and I had a small role in getting that done. Sometimes the simple things in life make a big impact as we even project them into our life with our Heavenly Father. You know, maybe it's time to, to say amen and understand where we fit in God's plan and how God has a plan that we don't understand and we don't always feel that we're a part of, but when it all comes together, it seems to make the right sense. We ended 1 Corinthians with the discussion last week of Jesus' return. Now, we were reminded that God has a plan. It includes Jesus, and it also includes us with our eternity. God has planned out Jesus' life as we look at the story of Christmas and the advent of the Savior coming, seeing the prophecies as they are fulfilled one by one. And here's my thought for you today. If God can plan out Jesus' life so intricate, can he not, does if he also have the capability and desire to plan your life out as well? Many times in life and history, it may not seem that God has a plan. And many people get to that point in life where they, where they feel dejected and they just don't think that God is working, that God is moving, uh, that God is directing what is happening. And that was the case in the time between the Testaments. Have you ever asked yourself that question? What happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament? The Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi. The New Testament begins with the book of Matthew. What happened between that? We're get, all of a sudden, Jesus comes. The, what I want you to hear is this. There's a period of 400 years in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning uh, of the New Testament. Uh, and in, but what we have from our uh, biblical record has a large bit of silence there. It seems like nothing has happened. It seems like nothing is going on. But in those 400 years, the terms and people of the New Testament began to appear. Pharisees and Sadducees come into place. Synagogues become a place of worship. Roman governors get in control. The family of Herod emerges. There are ideas and events that happen during that time, like the Maccabean Revolt, like the rise of the Essenes, like the dominance of the Greek language, the rise of the Roman Empire. Uh, there's stories that go on to help set up the coming of Christ at the right time through this period of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
It was even during that time that uh, the temple uh, there in Jerusalem is desecrated uh, by, the, uh, by the Greek emperor Antiochus Epiphanes who went in and sacrificed pigs there in the altar uh, and just totally disrupted uh, the flow and lifestyle and the worship and the spirituality uh, of the Jewish people. All of those things happened in between Malachi and Matthew. Keep that in mind as we look at our text today. Uh, our text, uh, excuse me, uh, is Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We'll be making reference to it uh, two or three times this morning. Luke chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 4. And, and this is the story, the Christmas story of Zechariah. Uh, it, the Christmas story begins with, uh, in uh, Luke's gospel, there's two places in uh, the scripture that you can read the Christmas story. Matthew, at the beginning of Matthew, uh, and at the beginning of Luke, uh, Mark makes very little reference to it, uh, and John takes it in a different perspective. Uh, but those are the two places that we go to read the Christmas story. Uh, Luke chapter uh, 1, and we'll begin reading with verse 4 uh, with the story of Zechariah and John the Baptist. Verse 4. Paul, is, or the writer Luke himself, is writing this letter, uh, and we'll pick it up there at four. Uh, and, and he writes this book, and he tells us this, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. He's making a record of Jesus' life. Verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple and burn incense. And when at the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then... An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, for many will rejo rejoice because of his birth. We have here in this quiet time, rarely a prophet had been spoke for 400 years. Rarely a message of God has happened, and we have a priest who's going to the temple, as he always does, and God opens up the curtain of heaven and interferes, intervenes into the life of humanity again. By sending an angel to talk to a priest and telling him that he's going to have a son. It's interesting that every time in the Bible, uh, when uh, it mentions a lady who is barren, uh, there's another part to the story that's about to happen. Because God is going to change the events uh, of their life. And we find out that Zachariah and his wife are, are both along in age. Uh, and, Zach, and they've given up the hope uh, of having a kid. But God then changes the story with what happens as the angel tells him to. Uh, I wanted to start with verse 4 because the account that Luke gives us here of the story of Jesus is an account for us to believe. To believe because it's true. The things that happen here in, the, in Scripture, uh, we can put our faith in because that's the way that God has provided us. And it says even there as we begin, so that you may know the certainty, you may know the exact truth of the things that you've been taught. Now, there's a lot of things that get misguided about the Christmas story. You know, one is even the time of year that it happens. Uh, it probably wasn't uh, at the same time uh, as what we celebrate. But the point is that we celebrate Jesus' birth uh, and uh, have the opportunity to be with him. But what I want you to see is underlying this story, God moves precisely because that's what truth does. He stands on the truth and he opens up the truth for us to see. Who is Zechariah? Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. And it's significant because the birth of John was a fulfillment of prophecy that God would send a forerunner for the Messiah. That there would be someone who would come to preach repentance before uh, Jesus would come, the Messiah, the Savior, would come uh, into the world. Uh, and even as it identifies who Zechariah and who Elizabeth are, Elizabeth's name has some reference to the fact of God's covenant, that God, uh, that God remembers his covenant uh, as he begins to open back up and start again his interaction with people uh, in the story of the Christmas story. 
Galatians 4, this idea is used several times uh, in uh, biblical writing. Uh, Paul writes to the church, at the right time, God sent his son to the world. Please understand that Christmas isn't a last minute brainstorm by the creator. Uh, some hectic throw together uh, just to, to have uh, something to change his plan. It's not a chance, it's not a plan B that God is interacting here. Uh, the story of Christmas and the story of the Messiah coming began at the beginning of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3, the promise uh, of with Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden after they sinned, that there would be a Savior, and it continues all throughout, not just the end of the book of Revelation, but with et eternity. Revelation chapter 13 talks about the book of life being opened at the end of the time, and it says that book belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered, before the creation of the world, that these things have been come into place, have been put in place for a long time before we see them and experience them, uh, even in our life today. And although I don't fully understand how eternity works, the Bible teaches that God knew, that God knows, even before he created man, exactly what was going to happen. And so he planned from the beginning of time to send Jesus to die on a cross for your sins, as a redeemer for us, to buy us back from our rebellion. Every detail of Jesus' life was prearranged. Every circumstance was perfect, and it always happened at the right time when God planned it. We look a little bit further into this historically when uh, the Christmas story happens, we'll see it was at the right time. Uh, the Greeks had come and controlled the uh, known world and at that same time had brought with it their language. Uh, their history tells us that at that time almost everyone understood the Greek language. And so it was easy to communicate the gospel message uh, in the ancient world. And it was the right time politically. Uh, we read that Caesar Augustus, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus uh, that all the world uh, should be taxed, right? As Luke uh, chapter 2 uh, reminds us that the Roman had then controlled after uh, Greek and they had created this uh, history, what was it? The Pax Romana, uh, the world of peace, the proclamation of peace with one ruler over the known world. It became very easy for the apostles to travel from one country to another uh, to help get God's church started at this time. It was the right time spiritually. For 2,000 years, God had been training the Jewish people to know the basics of their faith. They knew that there was one God. They knew that God was a spirit not made with hands. They knew that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming. But God had been silent for 400 years, so there was a spiritual void. It was not surprising then. When a star arrives uh, in the east, uh, that two, uh, that two wise, uh, that some wise men uh, get their attention and say, wait a minute, something must be going on. Let's go see what is happening. God's plan is at the right time, all the time. If you want to hold your finger there in Luke and just go to the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, I want to make a reference to what Peter says uh, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. He's going through the story of Jesus and trying to communicate what had happened and who Jesus was, uh, that uh, what had happened in his crucifixion and his resurrection. Uh, and uh, Peter proclaims there in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 23. Uh, let's start with 22 and following. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on them. Now Peter points out to the church that these things happened, that God knew that it was going to happen, that God planned that it was going to happen, and that this is God's plan for the world. So here's what it comes down to this morning. You need to know that God's plan, that God has a plan, that God has had a plan, that God's plan is eternal. What do you do to fit into God's plan? One could hear that and say, wait a minute. 
That's kind of scary. Uh, if you say it that way, uh, that uh, God has a plan, that means life is determined. And it really doesn't matter what I choose. No, 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 hardly. Don't go misplace uh, what is going on here. Uh, that's not the point that is made. Uh, God has a plan, and in his plan, he includes you. God's knowledge is so great that he placed us to accomplish his plan. Uh, his his, uh, his uh, understanding is so amazing and so awesome that God has put us in the places that he has for his purposes, and he will not be thwarted. So, 2020, that's God's plan. Life is tough. God doesn't promise that it's going to be easy, but he does promise to be with us through it. God will use 2020 just like he did 2019, 2018, 1999, 19, and go back to, to whatever date that you want. That history is planned and purposed by God. So what do we need to do? What, sto what do we understand from the story of Zechariah that helps us get in line with God's plan? Where do we find Zechariah? Chapter 1 of Luke, verses 6 and then verse 8. Let's look at those two a little closer. What was Zechariah doing? He was simply being faithful. Verse 6 uh, reminds us, both of them, talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Zechariah was doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, he was following God. He was living for God. He was making the choices the way that he knew that God wanted him to live. That's how you fit into God's plan. It tells us then in verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God. Do you know what Zechariah was doing from that? He was doing what he's supposed to. He is serving God. He is praying. He is being faithful to God's call. What do we need to do to fit into God's plan? Be faithful. It's that simple. Be faithful in prayer. Uh, the Gospel of Luke introduces prayer here in the Christmas story. And it's interesting that he highlights prayer more than any of the other Gospels because he sees the way that prayer works. Now, wait a minute, preacher, you may say. We need to pray to God even though God has predetermined and understands and has the foreknowledge of everything that happens? Yes, your God is that great. That's the answer to that. Yes, you still need to pray because God depends upon your prayers. He wants your prayers. He uses your prayers to accomplish his purposes that he already knows is going to happen in the future. What is your role? Be faithful to your Lord and Savior. Live for his glory. Live for his way. Learn how to worship him. Part of the passage in Luke chapter 1 that we didn't read, uh, I want to make a reference to here in a moment. Look what the angel says uh, to Zechariah about who John the Baptist uh, will be. Oh, there we go. Look, look at what he says in verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, he's telling Zechariah what his son will do. He will be a delight and joy to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, and turn hearts of fathers to their children, and disobedient to the wisdom of the right, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And now, that doesn't seem like the baby has much of a choice. That doesn't seem like John the Baptist has a whole lot of free will. If an angel comes to his dad and says, here's what your son's going to do. He's going to do this, and he's going to do that, and he's going to do this. Now, doesn't he have to go through a rebellious time? I mean, everybody does, right? Sarcasm. Uh, doesn't he have to live his own way and make his own choices and things? Yes, but Zechariah, as a faithful person, raises his son John to be a faithful person. And so the prophecies about John become true with John's decisions that God already knows is going to happen. It looks to me like John's life is pretty well planned out for him even before he's conceived. You could say the same thing about Jesus, right? Did Jesus have that choice? Did he have to make that choice that he was going to follow God? Did he have to make the choice that he was going to go to the cross? Yes, and God knew the choice that he was going to make for his purposes uh, and, and put him in that way. 
That leads us to verse 20 uh, here in Luke chapter 1. Uh, and this is the angel still talking uh, to, uh, to Zechariah. And he says there in verse 19, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens. Because you didn't believe all the words which will come true at their proper time. You know the story of Zechariah. Uh, he doesn't necessarily believe that he's going to have a kid because he's older. Uh, and we're not sure what surprise he brings uh, in front of Gabriel. But whatever happened in that little interaction, the angel said, okay, I'll show you. And to show you, you're going to be silent <laughs> until your baby is born. Oh, what a quiet household. Uh, that must have been. Uh, no arguments. Uh, however, that uh, was set up that way. Uh, and he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't able to, to speak until it was the day to name the baby. In fact, the Bible reports that everybody wanted to name the baby something else, Zacharias. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, God opened his tongue, he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> the angel said his name's John. His name is going to be John. Uh, but note the word that, he, that the angel says there, that this happens at the very last part of verse 20 which will come true at their proper time. It reminds us that God knows what's going to happen, that God has an eternal plan, and we are a part of it. And don't think of yourself so much that you're going to uh, thwart God's plan, uh, that you're going to misstep. God has you in the place that you have. All that you have to do is be faithful. Life is difficult. But that's what he calls us to do when things seem to fall apart around us. We need to look at Zechariah in the Christmas story and remember that God's got things covered. All we have to do is be faithful. I guess that's the reminder that I want you to know today, that God has a plan, that God has had a plan, and that God's plan is eternal. How do you get into his plan First off, you repent of your sin. Know that sin is never a part of God's plan. Your sin is never fulfilling God's desires, God's plan for your life. You have to quit making excuses. Quit with the rational, rationalizations and surrender and submit to the will and the word of God. God has a plan and you must be faithful to be a part of his plan. That plan also includes surrendering to Jesus making him your Lord and your Savior. It's easy to take Jesus as our Savior. We all need saved from hell. We all are scared of what fear it may be like on that last day to be separated from God. But more than that, as we respect what and understand what Jesus has done for us, we also need to make him our Lord so that the decisions that we made, that we make in life, are run through that filter. Is this something that will please Jesus? Is this something that is for Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of my life? Do I give the Lord God credit for the things that happen? Am I thankful for what he has done to prepare us, prepare us in our life? Am I grateful uh, and worship him in that way? Zechariah is a reminder that God has a plan, and God's plan always works. I think it's a, a good word to remember in tough times. We have to wonder, well, what in the world is going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. Who else is going to get sick? How bad is it going to get? When is it going to end? Oh, what is our world coming to? What is our nation coming to? Uh, here's all that I know. God's got a plan. And in the same way God showed his hand moving in the story of Zechariah, as he began his plan, and it was began the gospel message of the New Testament, we know that God is going to be faithful to us. He's always faithful. Are we faithful to him? We come to a time in our service to say, what can we do about it? Well, get your life right with the Lord. It's time for a decision. It's time to think about what God has done for us and what we do to respond to him, repenting of our sin, uh, confessing those sins, getting our lives right with God, making Jesus our Lord and Savior, being baptized into his spirit. If we can help you in those decisions, like we do every Sunday, the call of God is real, the plan of God is magnificent, and he has put you into his plan. That's the great news of the gospel message. Will you respond today?
our human decision, I think, is a way in a manger. I'm not sure of the number. 261, please stand as we sing. First and last verse.
Christmas story remind us and focus our hearts uh, as we partake here in communion uh, is a story with the angel with Mary uh, and the words that he speaks to her. He says, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Let's pray. that we are going to give to those people who haven't been to church for a while, uh, who made the choice to kind of stay at home uh, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, if you're online listening and have a, hear a knock at your door, uh, know that uh, we're thinking of you and we just want to share. Those of you who are passing it out, what we uh, do intend is to remind them that we're praying for them. Uh, so uh, have a word of prayer before uh, you take the packet to them. A phone call just to remind them that you're coming, uh, something along that line. Uh, but uh, we'll pray for them here uh, as we conclude our service today, too. We also uh, want to extend the opportunity to help people in the community. Maybe there's a family you know who uh, needs some extra help for uh, the Christmas season. Uh, please let uh, Greg or I or uh, the Benevolent Group know, and we'd like to give them some gifts to help them through that. So uh, communicate that with us as we have in the past, and we'd like to... Uh, be a blessing uh, to some people who, who need the extra encouragement this, this year. Uh, we are going to have a Christmas program uh, for the young people on uh, December the 20th. Uh, I have no idea what it's going to look like. In fact, uh, it's going to be a no-practice Christmas program. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, beware of what that could look like uh, and, and uh, what it will be like. Uh, but on the 20th, the Sunday before Christmas, uh, we'll have uh, a program for our kids. I, I think we'll have them, and we'll make another note next week. But if they could be here a little bit earlier that day, just to kind of throw them in the right position uh, to, to make that happen, uh, I did want to let you know that we are still planning on doing that. Uh, and uh, it'll be, of course, uh, put uh, out there for people to see uh, through video as well. Any other announcements that we need to make? Okay, well, let's stand and close with a word of prayer. Uh, be praying for somebody who's not here. Uh, some of them have made choices not to be able to be here. Maybe uh, they're sick and need that encouragement. Uh, but uh, we're going to pick a different family in your mind uh, and uh, take a moment and pray for them. Uh, I'll pause for about 10 seconds uh, and let you do that, uh, and then we'll close with a word of prayer together. Let's be quiet for 10 seconds. Father God, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. May we be that blessing to others. May we be that example of your son. We thank you for the way that your spirit transforms us, works on us, uh, helps us uh, in, in our decisions, and, and forgives us our sins, making us right with you. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that as we move into this Christmas time, uh, and even beyond, to remember uh, that we represent you. Uh, Lord, give us the encouragement and the faith uh, to be faithful uh, to your will. We pray, Lord, for our missionaries who are out there working, uh, trying to communicate your gospel uh, in places maybe where they're more isolated. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the people next door who may or may not know you. And we pray for those who are a part of us here at Bethlehem who haven't been able to be with us. Uh, please, Lord, uh, remind them uh, that they are loved and uh, that we care about them in the same way. Uh, be an encouragement and a comfort, uh, a 
uh, healing to them uh, as well. We pray all these things because we know that you can do uh, even more measurably uh, than what we can think or even proclaim with our lips. We praise you because you are great and awesome. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray.